everyone. Welcome to the Field and Garden Podcast. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop. Today I'm sharing a clubhouse chat where Lisa talks about proper flower harvesting, covering all the most common mistakes and questions that people tend to have. We hope you enjoy this chat and find some useful tips that you can implement in your garden or cut flower field. Welcome friends to the Flower Farmer Show. My name is Lisa Mason Ziegler, and I am joined here um, by friend, fellow flower farmer, and TGW crew member, Jesse Graven. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Lisa. Hello, everyone. And um, before I jump into our topic of the week, and today we're talking about the lifeline of a cutting garden, and that's harvesting. And I understand people's confusion. There is a lot to learn about harvesting, a lot of different steps. The lifeline of a cutting garden undoubtedly is harvesting. And it's probably the most misunderstood and not practiced part of a garden. Um, I can remember back in the days when I used to, when I was doing lots of conferences and a lot of programs for different groups, mainly like garden clubs and master gardener groups. And I would do the cutting garden program. And I can remember one of my steps and one of my recommendations to people was to locate your cutting garden out of sight of your kitchen sink or where you can sit in the house and look at it. And people would kind of look perplexed when I'd say that. And it's because When you can enjoy the beautiful garden from inside your home, you are even less likely to cut and harvest that garden because you're enjoying it too much visually. And that in fact is not what a cutting garden is all about. And the first time you skip the regular routine of cutting your garden twice a week, it is the beginning of the end of your cutting garden. Every, all systems, turn to sluggishness when you stop cutting and then they literally ultimately shut down. And um, I even know of seasoned growers sometimes that still fall victim to this. Um, I will say if there is one thing that one regiment that we stuck to like glue for all the years that we've been farming is we harvested every Monday and Thursday on my farm short of torrential rain and major, you know, events, um, it happened regardless. So the stage to harvest, you know, I've made this little list here. Well, actually, I want to talk about what you're harvesting into first. Um, If you're not willing to drink water out of whatever it is that you are harvesting into, you shouldn't be putting flowers into it. And that is because if they are not washed properly or just washed, period, I mean, I know how easy it is to dump buckets and just set them aside and then you just fill them up for the next time. Well, friends, what happens is a scum builds up on the bottom of those buckets where the water level was. And in that scum, um, it's kind of like the ring around the bathtub. That's exactly what your what is in your buckets, and that harbors bacteria, and it in fact will even hold bacteria um, even when the bucket is dry. So when you do add water the next time, you instantly get bacteria. Versus if you had a clean bucket, it would be a day or so before bacteria would naturally start growing um, by just sitting there. So clean buckets are paramount. I actually have a bucket washing station on our farm. Um, And when I built the building that I worked out of for all these years and still do, um, we, I knew that I needed a more convenient way to wash buckets and a way to dry buckets. Um, So I have a big double laundry sink. It's a double bowl sink, just like your kitchen sink probably, but it's in a laundry tub size. Um, And it's located on a carport. And I've created a space where um, we put down bulb crates so that the bottom layer of buckets are up off the concrete so that they can dry inside. And then we stagger step 
stack them so that they can actually dry. And that's, that's kind of our bucket holding situation. Um, so our buckets are clean. And then when we use a measuring stick, which I think there's images of that in Vegetables Love Flowers, how we use that. We have a measuring stick that tells us when we have a gallon of water in our bucket because our conditioning products, um, which we put CVB in tablets, which is the chlorine tablet in every harvest bucket. Um, and it takes one gallon of water, according to instructions. Um, and so those steps buy you a couple of days. Every step along the way that we're gonna kind of talk about is gonna add more and more vase life to your flowers. Some flowers need special handling, some don't. Um, and we will, um, let's just walk through the process. So now that you have a clean container and we, I recommend and we only use basically plastic containers. Um, the products, the conditioning products can have a bad reaction when used in metal cans. Um, so you don't wanna use those um, during this process. I understand at the farmer's market, if you wanna use something different to display, they make all kinds of plastic liners to go inside of them, but just so you're aware of that. So the next most important step um, is the time of day that you're gonna harvest. Now there's, depending on the flowers you're talking about, because everything, nothing is everything in the flower world, right? I mean, there's exceptions to every rule, but in general, it is thought that harvesting earlier in the day before the plants and the stems go through the heat of the day where they get kind of depleted and exhausted um, of their resources that are stored up in the stem um, is the best time. However, there are some flowers, um, and I've never really practiced this because I've always been a, an early day harvester. There are some flowers that I understand that there can be benefit to cutting them in the evening after they have spent the day adding up carbohydrates in their stems. Um, I don't think that's even significant enough to think about. I mean, you can't get all caught up in these kinds of details, but I'm just saying there are some people that can't harvest in the morning for whatever reason. So the evening harvest, and I mean evening like, like not long before sundown, um, would be the second choice. The morning harvest, um, we even start like at the crack of dawn at six o'clock in the morning. Um, I've really learned you know, from my farm because we have dew often, um, which means that there's moisture on many of the flowers. I've learned what flowers can be cut moist and which ones can't, meaning they don't last as long when they are put into a bucket with moisture still on them. Um, so we are morning harvesters. Um, and if you are thinking to yourself, oh my gosh, I have so many flowers and I'm a one person show, there's no way I can get them all harvested in the morning. Well, that is when you start thinking to yourself, maybe it's time to either get help or to downsize what you're growing, or you're going to have to move to multiple days to harvest versus like twice a week, which is the optimal for business efficiency. And um, so for us, our goal, like right now, when we're going up to the mid nineties, after we eat lunch, we eat lunch every day from 12 to 1230. And when we come back after lunch at 1230, first off, everybody's exhausted. I mean, we've already been cutting since six o'clock that morning and it is so much hotter outside um, that the flowers even are about to wilt when you cut them. Um, so, our goal has always been during the heat of summer where we, we're fighting humidity, heat, gnats, mosquitoes, you know, every annoyance possible outdoors in the garden. Um, we do our best to either have enough people or to have a plan to be able to stop harvesting by noon, if not sooner. Um, so the time of day is pretty significant. So the next really important step that is so important, and I will just say, yes, you do have to know this for every flower that you're growing, and that is the stage to harvest. And it varies from flower to flower. Um, the two most obvious 
are, let's just take a sunflower and a coxcone. Sunflowers, we harvest when barely the first petal is lifting off the face of the flower, meaning it's not even open yet. You can see the yellow petals, but they haven't opened up. They're still laying flat on the brown disc or the green disc, whatever sunflower you're growing. When that first petal lifts is when we harvest, when we aim to harvest sunflowers. That prevents all insect damage to the petals most often. Where grasshoppers and cucumber beetles just chew holes and damage the petals, we prevent that by harvesting at the correct stage. Those sunflowers will quickly and easily continue to open indoors in the air conditioning with no pests and be beautiful and perfect blooms. Coxcomb, on the other hand, the minute you cut the stem, they stop developing 100%. Azenia is the very same way. So that means if you cut it early, it's going to look exactly like what you cut. It's not going to change at all. Um, and some flowers that are that way, if you cut them too soon, their stems aren't even stiff enough to support them. And you'll have wilting that you can't fix other than sticking a wire up a stem, which a flower farmer has no time for. So you have got to learn the stage to harvest for every flower that you're cutting. And I'm going to say it right now, Rhonda, um, our warehouse manager here, um, who is also, you know, master gardener, longtime gardener, been a, worked on our farm. I mean, so she's never been a commercial flower farmer, but she has everything except the fact that she's never been the business owner. She knows that we were talking about how many old flowers we see being sold and shown on social media. Friends, you have got to figure the stage to harvest out. It is so significant, um, especially, and I mean, I understand. So you're going to have to do some experimenting. You know, the one that I like to think of is azuratum. I think most everybody cuts that stuff too late. I learned long ago when the, you know, the, the flower is made up of a bunch of little, um, little individual flowers make up the cluster of the blue azuratum. And when the very first one starts to get fuzzy is when I cut it. And it quickly, the rest of them get fuzzy in the bouquet, but they last and look so much more brilliant and beautiful in the bouquet when they are harvested at that correct stage. And I think part of what happens to people is we overplant, we have too much to do, and instead of cutting, we, it's kind of like the spoiled milk cycle that used to happen maybe back in the day when your mom would make you drink the milk that's almost out of date while she has the new milk sitting there getting old with its expiration date, and by the time you're finished the old milk, the new milk is now old. That's exactly what happens when we're cutting flowers, exactly. Friends, I am telling you, people go in to cut, they're busy cutting so many of the old stems that they're leaving the primo stems in the garden, which will be your old stems the next time. You got to get ahead of that wave. So you've got to learn the proper stage to harvest, not when you think it needs to be, but when the longest life and the best, I mean, I am always striving to find the earliest I can cut one. So you got to learn that stage. Then what do you do after you cut it? You're dropping them in the bucket. You're going to use a bucket of the proper size so they're not sliding down. Are you going to leave buckets sitting out in the hot sun while you continue harvesting? I mean, we used to have a harvest trailer that had 30 buckets on it. Some flowers didn't seem to mind sitting out in the sun for another hour after it was cut. Other flowers would never be hydrated again, after suffering through that heat. So you really have to pay attention to even what you do with them after you um, harvest them. So we tended to have runners that would move the buckets indoors to air conditioning in the heat of the day um, to get them inside to start their resting period. Flowers really need at least four hours to recover from being harvested, friends, you just literally cut their throat. You cut off all their supply chain of food, nourishment, 
moisture. You have to, and many times they will wilt almost immediately. But that afternoon they're coming back up, but the next morning for sure, that's always been our practice is we harvest on a Monday morning and then Tuesday morning we come out to pack and they would all be recovered from that. Um, and then you have to really think about what are you gonna do with them and the packing process. Um, one of the problems that I see a lot of people make, because I see people do it, especially when they would come for our members only market, people picking up flowers out of a bucket and holding stems that they're going to get, then leaning over other buckets, dripping water from those stems on the face of other flowers. Friends, that is like introducing Botrytis 101. Um, you do not want to be dripping water. And I'm telling you, I say a lot of people do this. I mean, people that work for me for a long time, still almost every season I would have, say, have to say things like, hey, look, you're, dri you're dripping water on the face of those um, because you, it's just hard to remember. So that is just your reminder of that. Um, do you have a cooler or not? You know, whether you have a cooler or not can really affect what crops you grow, that's when you need to be thinking about whether you have a cooler or not. Um, but, you know, you need to know what temperature those flowers do best at um, and plan accordingly. And then I just want to wrap it up and say that don't sell old flowers. Nothing will affect your customer base more than that. Um, you know, my motto is, is like, holy cow. I mean, we pump so many flowers out of a small space. Why would I risk selling a flower I think might be old? I'll drop a flower in a heartbeat in the pathway or put it in the dump. This morning I was pulling flowers out and I thought to myself, I always think to myself of my friend Robin Locker, who is no longer with us. Robin used to say, she's one of my neighbors. She used to say, I just want to walk behind you in the garden and get the flowers out of the pathway, you know, because the flowers I throw down, a lot of people would say, oh, that's a good flower. No, it's not. It is not. We have so many more flowers that are better and younger than that one. Why would I even risk using that? And I say that because sometimes people just need the okay to trash flowers. Um, and you just don't want to become a part of that vicious old milk cycle, friends. Hi, welcome up onto the stage. Do you have a question for me? Hi there, I sure do. I am uh, first year, I am not a, a flower farmer, but I'm just, I'm dabbling. Um, I saw a garden hack on social media where they were stripping the leaves down to the ground prior to cutting the flower. What are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, so we definitely do that for sunflowers. Um, 100% that was, I could not believe that I farmed for 10 years before on Dave Dowling's farm. I went to a conference and a farm visit and sure enough, I watched somebody do that. Um, so, and I, and I don't know if I saw the same one that you saw. I saw somebody doing that on stock, I think. Um, the point for me with sunflowers is you can, because the sunflowers are pretty tall. I do not do that for sunflowers and early in the season when they're still kind of short. But once they, like last night, I was cutting sunflowers that are the same height as me. It is just such a back saver to just hold the head of the sunflower and strip all of the leaves, obviously wearing gloves um, and leave. I only leave one leaf at the very top of next to the bloom. Um, and that's just super convenient. That means you're dropping the leaves in the garden. You don't have to, you know, stop and strip them in your hand. It's much more efficient. And then after I strip the entire bed, most often I go back and then cut and collect them. And it really makes for super efficiency. So I say that that, I mean, for any crop that that works for you, when I watched that person do a stock, I thought, oh my gosh, stock, I'm bending over you know, to cut that. That's not one that I would think would work for me, but it totally would depend on your conditions. Was that the one that you saw too? Yeah, actually it was. Yes. Thank okay. you. You're so welcome. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing that. It's just whether is it really beneficial for you to do that? And I'm just trying to think what other tall crops there might be that, um, that might work with, but yeah, total time saver. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, and that was, 
I, I can still remember my, I'm sure my mouth dropped open a half a foot when I saw them do that. And it was like, and when you start growing a lot of sunflowers like we do, I mean, it turns you into a lightning harvester for that. So, all right, Jess, yeah. any more? Yeah, I have one on the back channel that was asking about um, stage of harvest for Campanula Champion. Uh, she was saying they seem to come on really fast, faster than I could than I could sell it. And um, is there a way to prevent that or hold it in the cooler? Uh, and maybe I'm not harvesting it at the right stage, um, and I'm you know letting it get old in the garden, perhaps. Sure. So that's a really great question. Um, and I just grew Campanula again this year for the first time in several years. And I'm not sure why, but the deer didn't touch it. That's why I stopped growing Campanula because it seemed to be a deer magnet on our farm. Um, but anyway, so Campanula opens from the top to the bottom. No, from the bottom to the top. Now that I'm questioning myself, regardless of which way it opens, we like to harvest it when just the first one or two bells are open. And when you cut them at that stage, they will continue to open indoors. Um, and when you cut them at that stage, you can hold them a little bit longer. You know, that would definitely um, be one that for sure should go into CVBN tablets when you cut it. So that initial drink is a fresh bacteria free water. And then if you need to, if you don't move it out, um, through your normal channels like you think you're going to do, then I would definitely store it in the cooler and I would put it in with a tea bag, holding tea bag, with a, which has holding solution, which keeps the water clean, keeps it a little bit, new, new, you know, a little food source, um, but it also continues to keep the water in pretty good shape. Um, and the other thing is, is that um, Campanula, and again, Campanula Champion, that's the specific variety we're talking about um, because it is um, does not require vernalization as many of the other Campanulas do. Um, but you can pinch half of it when it's, you know, starting to shoot up in the spring, whether we fall planted it. Um, and that's another succession planting tip. So you can pinch half, fall plant, pinch half of it. And that will delay some of the blooms of the pinched ones. You can also, um, in addition to that, maybe not plant as much in the fall, plant again in what's very early spring, which is six to eight weeks before your last frost date. And that again will stagger your um, bloom time out a little bit. But I 100% agree with you, Campanula comes on fast and heavy and hard. Um, and that's just the nature of the beast. So um, I have another question about harvesting. Someone had asked, how do you keep from damaging the flowers when pulling them through netting? Oh, what a good question. So I am a huge netting fan. Um, I mean, I, I have lived on my farm long enough to know that sometimes, like right now, I have beds that are unnetted, but we're doing that because of photography requirements. And every time we get rain, I literally hold my breath. Um, I have learned that pretty much everything benefits from being netted, but we rarely get to do the job of netting everything just because there's not enough of us to go around. And then once you miss the window of the proper height, to get it on by, then it really becomes a really pain in the neck. So netting should be installed with, at, the ha at the halfway mature mark. So that means if you have a plant or crop that's going to supposedly grow to 48 inches, that means the best place for the netting is at 24 inches, halfway. That's the difference between, um, you know, if, if somebody, if you're standing up and I'm standing behind you and I, I'm going to try to to um, hold you upright, um, the strongest place I can give you the best support is to support your hip area, the middle of your body, not by holding your neck or by holding your ankles, right? So you want the netting at the halfway mark. You have to install it before the plants reach there. 
And what our practice is, is to install this netting and to put it at that halfway point, because we know the reality of us moving the netting up, which is what some people do, is not realistic. We just never get back there. So if your netting is at the proper height, um, the most difficult part of harvesting with netting is the first cut if you didn't pinch your plants. When you pinch your plants, you create long stems that don't have nearly as many side shoots as the central stem, if you didn't pinch it out, that central stem has lots of branches. So we rarely pinch zinnias, only because we don't have time to do it. So I am the first cutter of all the zinnias for this very reason. The way that I handle the netting with the zinnias is with the first cut is I go in and make the cut, I mean, like probably six inches away from the ground level, leaving three or four side shoots of the zinnia. And instead of trying to pull that up through the netting, I pull it down and out the side. Okay. So instead of pulling it up through the netting, I make, I reach down and make the cut and then I just kind of push it. I mean, you get pretty good at it. I'm actually pretty quick at it now. Um, you just push the um, end of the stem near the side of the bed and you just reach under the netting and grab it out. And then you can pick it up and strip it and go on to the next one. You don't have to do that but one time. Um, but if you pinched and your stems are all side shoots, that means you're not going to have that big of, you know, this is maybe a reason that pinching would be a good thing to do, right? Um, but I will tell you that most often in my experience also with netting is the reason most people have trouble is because their netting is installed incorrectly. And what I mean by that is not the height level that it's installed at, that's one of the denominators, but the other one is, is I see dangerous netting almost daily on social media. It is loose. It is hanging down the sides. Um, our netting, um, the way that we install it is you install one end of the bed with the stakes. You go to the other end of the bed and you pull it as tautly as you can and install the stakes at the, that end. That means the two ends are installed first and it is taunt. It is not super tight, but it is tight. It's like pantyhose, y'all. It's that kind of tight on your leg. It's not cutting off your circulation, but it's tight enough to stay up, right? Then you're going to go down all the way down one side of the row, putting the stakes in at the appropriate width. So when you're going down the other side of the bed, you are pulling it tautly from side to side and you are putting the stakes across from each other. You're not staggering them. Um, and when you do that and it's at the proper height, I can cut bachelor buttons that are in netting lightning fast because you figure out how to do it. And um, I, I mean, I read the nightmare stuff on social media about people trying, they show pictures of what they're trying to harvest through. And I totally agree. Um, we've never found it necessary to have double netting, not even in dahlias. Um, so hopefully that helps. I think so. Uh, she did reply back that she thinks she probably has her netting set too high for the crop she was talking about. So I think that that helps. That'll do it. Yeah. So I don't have any other uh, questions right now, but I wanted to just mention that um, if folks are getting to a point where they're doing some harvesting, uh, you know, later on in the season even and, and have questions or want to have a follow up conversation, we do have a Facebook group where we continue conversations from these chats, and it's called The Flower Farmer Show. You can join it if you are a flower farmer or you are aspiring to become one. You can go over on Facebook and type in The Flower Farmer Show and request to join and fill out the questions there. So it's a big group, but it's a very active group. There's lots of questions and answers and lots of interaction. So I encourage uh, anyone that's not in that group uh, to go over there and check it out. Thank you, Jesse. And I also want to invite everyone. Um, I don't know if you know it or not, but we actually, the Gardener's Workshop has its own phone app now. You can find it in your app store, Gardener's Workshop 
live shop and I do a live from the farm shopping show every Friday at 12 noon Eastern time, you know, grab your lunch and sit down and it's really a lot of fun. We, I share the harvest of the week, showing the blooms, giving more tips about the seeds, um, you know, when perhaps you might be when you should harvest or um, when you should plant them, um, as well as other seasonal tips, along with you have the option to shop and pick up the stuff. There's a buy button right there. Um, and the one unique thing about our shopping show is that we have specials over there that aren't available anywhere else. It's just good through the show and until 8 a.m. the following Saturday, that's following morning, which is Saturday morning. Um, and we do various different things. Sometimes it's a product that's not available anywhere else. Sometimes it's a free offer. Um, so we, it's from the farm, it's Suzanne and I, and we really have a lot of fun. And seeing all the gorgeous blooms um, is has been really, really helpful for people. So you can go to your app store for iPhones or Droids, go to Google Play and just search Gardener's Workshop live shop and i would love to see you on friday great thank you lisa appreciate you having this conversation with us today and i appreciate everybody out there in the audience as always thank you friends ciao okay welcome back i've included some links in the show notes to topics that were mentioned here there's also a link to lisa's club on clubhouse if you join us over there you'll be notified when lisa schedules new chats and you'll also be able to replay all of our prior chats there as well. If you like what you're hearing here on the Field and Garden podcast, we'd love it if you'd tell a friend about us and leave a review for us wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Jessie from the Gardener's Workshop, and I hope you have a great day.